Operation Spearbreaker was a bog-standard DLC pack, just kind of an okay experience that gave fans of Halo Wars 2 another two hours to enjoy their game. But the real build-up and hype for the Halo Wars 2 live service period was Awaken the Nightmare, the DLC that 343 put all its time and effort into producing. It was quite the promise put into this project, pitting the Banished against the Flood in an entirely new circumstance that threatens to rip apart their entire operation. It was an exciting and bold idea, selling that lack from the original game, and one that would not come without a hefty price tag. Awaken the Nightmare cost $20 on top of the base game, but considering that I got about 5 hours of content out of the 5 mission pack, I didn't consider it such a huge ask since I've played some games with single player campaigns that were over within 6 hours. As we dive into the true horror of Halo's better years, the game starts us off with the promised protagonist switch from the humans to the banished as the player gets put into the shoes of two of Atriox's underlings, Pango and Vince, who end up getting tasked with investigating the crash site of High Charity, the Covenant capital city that crashed Deus Ex Machina style into the Ark of all places. It's almost like 343 is making all this shit up as it goes along because it has no idea what it's doing. Atriox's orders are simple for those near ape creatures to understand. Scout high charity and salvage what you can. Do anything else and face execution since that's exactly the way that you motivate any rational being. The DLC decides to not blow its load immediately as it starts off with a simple mission to get through a forest, defeat the straggling sentinels, and make a way for the banished to get to high charity. After they get closer to the wreck site, it appears that an entire city crashing onto a near planet sized machine didn't exactly make for the cleanest crater, so the banished send in a goddamn scarab to help push through to the prize. It's a long and tedious escort quest to protect the tank from incoming threats, something so redundant that you could have all your units standing in the middle of the battlefield picking their noses, and the Scarab would just be completing its mission without any help, because the Scarab has huge health and defense stats along with being able to recover its health when not in combat. About halfway through this mission, even the humans are ready to join in the party, only to get totally steamrolled by the increased banished threat they walked right into. They should have given me the meat grinder achievement at least, considering how flattened the humans ended up. The weird thing is that for what happens later, we don't actually see the humans on the arc past this point. Even when the floods start parasitizing the fallen, you never see any human corpses in the horde. Maybe they had the sense to recall all ground troops and stay floating in the sky until everything calmed down. And for one more twist, on the way to high charity, Pango discovers an access terminal for the Sentinel defenses that have been harassing the Scarab the entire way up here, and so decides to shut it off so they can have a clear path to opening the lid on this high charity wreck and begin looking for anything useful. And because of the name of the DLC and all the marketing and taglines around the DLC and also because the game centers around goddamn high charity, the most fucked city in the universe except for Gary, Indiana, you knew the outcome of this from a mile away. Yep, since Pango and Vince opened the shield surrounding High Charity like the world's manliest cling film, the Flood end up tearing up the entire installation. They only managed to grab the banish since they stupidly hung around trying to brute force their way through a problem that only gets worse the more people start dying to go into it. And because the Sentinel defenses are now deactivated because of somebody, the Flood become the dominant species of the Ark. The rest of the DLC is spent on developing a plan on the Ark to take care of the unstoppable threat to everything. Throughout this series on Boss Cinerator, I have given 343 all the shit I can muster for its over-reliance on ideas from the original trilogy and just making up bullshit in order to continue Microsoft's most profitable exclusive. But... I will give the publisher some amount of credit for going all out with revamping the Flood for the second trilogy because the universe spanning parasites actually evolved between the events of both trilogies. 
343 introduces a lot of ridiculously powerful flood types in Halo Wars 2 that I'm sure will be coming out in the main series at some point. The flood developed types of flood that can fly, shoot bullets like a Gatling gun, and even giant flood monsters that are able to buff up any flood around it significantly. And then there's the final boss of the game which ends up being the super evolution of the flood in that they try to develop another grave mind to make some order out of all the chaos. Things start going so bad with the Super Flood that they even manage to develop a Flood form that is able to parasitize vehicles onto their side. Like what the actual fuck have the Flood been doing since Halo 3? After the reveal of the Flood, the DLC becomes a protracted race against the clock and all the zombies in the world. Since Pango and Vince stupidly went inside of High Charity to look for salvage and deactivated the Sentinels along for the bargain, the Banished have to scramble and find a way to reactivate those security security measures and give themselves a fighting chance against a threat that keeps improving itself at an exponential rate. These Super Flood are powerful to the extreme! It seems like it only took a small amount that was on high charity an hour before everything around the Banished started falling apart. Yet I do have to laugh at Atriox's reaction to the re-emergence of the Flood. He sounds like a disappointed father yelling at his kid for spilling grape juice on the couch. The missions in the later parts of Awaken the Nightmare are pretty inventive for a genre of game that usually fall back on destroy all the bases when the creators ran out of ideas and beer, but instead we get holding the line missions and ones where you have to do literal resource gathering because the game decided to randomly take away your ability to produce energy during the DLC's third mission and use that to power a mining drill that'll hit the core of the flood really hard. Then that follows with an abysmal escort quest where Pango had to take jumper units with him that barely have any health and become a priority target whenever Flood are nearby. Add to that that this escort quest is one of the longest missions in the DLC and the jumpers have to survive for the entire runtime through thin corridors and you've got the entire bullshit sandwich all at one time. This mission at least gave us a real-time challenge where you had to have your units dodge laser traps and reach the other side to shut them off. That was a unique gameplay idea, and I appreciate an innovative way to use the game's otherwise pedestrian mechanics. The final mission of the game is where Atriox gets really pissed off and literally says that Pango and Vince have to solve the zombie apocalypse before he comes down planetside, or he's going to be really mad at them and ground them for two weeks. Atriox either doesn't give a shit, or this is some sort of unintended parody, I swear. The final mission involves the player destroying the Proto Grave Mine, which started developing six hours into the Flood Invasion, because the Super Flood are that damned scary. This mission is rather difficult, and also not really because the big problem is that there's tons of respawning infinite enemies all over the map, and they're in huge numbers and really tough. But it isn't like you require a strategy to defeat this mission, just keep churning out units like crazy and pile them onto the enemies until the grave mind is defeated. The only snag in this plan is that it takes a long ass time to finish the mission, mostly because for whatever flippin' reason the game designers decided that it would be a great idea to gate off most of the battlefield for the entire fight, leaving a lot of your backup minions stuck on the wrong side of impenetrable gates, leaving the player only able to work with mini bases to turn out new units. The mini bases can only produce a limited number of units that are in no way able to handle the huge flood armies being brought in to defend the grave. And then there's another design problem in this mission that makes it even more difficult to finish in ludicrously face palm fashion. Because of how the game's AI works for the player's units, when you send them in to fight the Grave Mine, which is constantly spawning minions to defeat the Banished, your units will be constantly deselecting the Grave Mine as their main target and keep attacking the meaningless minions. At points in this mission, I was spamming the target select button because every other second, there was a new flood coming onto the battlefield and my main units were attacking them instead of the giant wall of flesh in front of them. God, it was aggravating, long, and tedious to complete this mission. There were so many design missteps in The Awakens' final mission that I'm wondering if anyone on Creative Assembly actually went back and gave it a look over before it was sent out for final approval. This isn't Creative's first time at the rodeo, so overlooking basic problems in the mission with its AI and field design seems even more glaring failures. 
I don't think I'm asking for the world here to ask that maybe you should have programmed in a priority for the boss to be the first target. Well, at least when the Grave Minus had all four of its weak points shot up and with the Sentinel security device now online, the Ark thankfully decides to summon a Retriever in to take down the Grave Mine for good and leaves the Banished in a better position to survive the Flood Invasion. Don't hold your breath, I'll guarantee that the Banished are still going to become the new Grave Mine's puppets because literally nothing in this series has been able to take out the Flood once and for all. And during the final cutscene, I have to ask Atriox, what the hell did he expect would happen when he told his soldiers to salvage high charity? In order to salvage something, you probably have to go inside the thing and see if there's anything worth taking for the cause. It's not like you're going to haul high charity lock, stock, and barrel back to the garage and start piecing it together. Atriox is really annoying in this DLC because it comes off sounding like he's getting pissed off with Pango and Vince when they did exactly what he asked them to do. Otherwise, Awaken the Nightmare is a true additional campaign that'll add at least another four hours of playtime to Halo Wars 2 and adds in new units, a new faction, and all the goodies alongside that for you to play with in other modes, and it's the DLC that was built with the intent of what DLC was originally for, giving the player an entire unique piece of content to enjoy after the game was finished and substantially increased play time. It was a bold reintroduction to the flood threat from the original trilogy and a spectacular campaign filled with challenges that'll give your strategy brain a real workout. If you still have your copy of this turn-based spin-off then I recommend the DLC pack during your next gaming weekend.